Coming soon, to Hastings Mystery Theater. Ellery Queen and the Perfect Crime, it's a 1941 mystery thriller. The famed sleuth helps his inspector father solve the murder of a shady utilities promoter. Hi there, old movie fans? Did you know, most old films before the 1940s are lost forever due to a variety of reasons. One of the primary reasons is that the film reels were made of nitrate, which is highly flammable and can easily catch fire. As a result, many films were destroyed in fires, such as the 1937 Archive Fire that destroyed every movie Fox Studios made before 1932. Another reason is that the film stock deteriorates over time, especially if not stored properly. Older film stocks actually decay into a substance similar to gunpowder. As a result, many films from the silent era have been lost forever, including more than 90% of silent films from before 1929, and according to the American Film Institute, an estimated 50% of American sound films made before 1950 are lost forever. Once sound came along, silent films were rarely rescreened, and studios had no financial incentive to keep them. The early medium of film didn't yet value its history to any great extent, and studios simply destroyed old prints to clear vault space for more recent releases. In the past, the term preservation was synonymous with duplication of film. It is important to note that the quality of the transfer can also depend on the medium to which the film is being transferred. For example, transferring a film from 35mm to VHS will result in a significant loss of quality compared to transferring the same film to a digital format. Many old movies are no longer shown on major TV networks, due to the expiration of broadcast rights, declining popularity, or quality loss due to the transfer of the film to a new medium. In conclusion, the loss of old films is a tragedy for film lovers and historians alike. So please understand why these old films look fuzzy and have unwanted noise. We hope you enjoy the movie. Good evening. Welcome to Hastings Mystery Theater. I'm your host and mystery master, Randall Schaefer. Tonight, the corridors of mystery take us to 1940 for a 20th Century Fox movie, Michael Shane, Private Detective. This was the first of 12 Michael Shane films produced from 1940 through 1942, and all of them starred Lloyd Nolan as Michael Shane. Lloyd Nolan was born in San Francisco in 1902, and he failed out of Stanford for seldom attending classes because he wanted to be an actor. He began his career and stage career and was lured to Hollywood where he spent an entire career making mostly B-movies. He is best remembered for playing the small town doctor who performs an illegal abortion on a girl raped by her father in the 1957 movie Peyton Place. Lloyd Nolan died in 1985 at age 83 his last role was on the TV show Murder, She Wrote. In 1946, PRC Studios made five more Michael Shane movies, all starring Hugh Beaumont. Hugh Beaumont, you may remember, played Beaver Cleaver's father on the Leave it to Beaver show, but that this was much earlier than that. Michael Shane was literary creator of author Brett Halliday. The first Michael Shane book was published in 1939, and Halliday continued writing them through 1958, and when he retired, he allowed the publisher to engage other writers, so Michael Shane books continued for many more years. This is the first movie in the series. In this movie, a millionaire hires Michael Shane to ride herd on his spoiled daughter and prevent her from gambling away all of his money. The daughter is being pursued by a young man interested in the daughter's eventual inheritance. Michael Shane tries to keep the girl out of trouble even after her boyfriend has been murdered by gamblers. The millionaire, his daughter, and Michael Shane himself are all suspects, so Shane must protect them by solving the murder by himself. Can Michael Shane solve the murder? If he couldn't, they would never have made 11 more Michael Shane movies. Let's return to 1940 and enjoy Lloyd Nolan as Michael Shane in Michael Shane, Private Detective. It's Regina and Radio Choice. Regina come on, and Radio come on, Choice head and head. And here comes Gal Vale moving up fast in the middle of the track. It's a driving finish and it's going to be close. It's a photo finish. Oh, I hope my nag takes a good photograph. 
The result of the race is official. Well, Finney? Nope, he was camera shy. Shy $50. $50? Phyllis, you should have better sense than to bet that much money on one race. Don't you realize the percentage is against you? Well, it's going to be with me in the next race. I've got a sizzling tip on Banjo Boy. Banjo Boy? Mm -hmm. That's Elliot Thomas's horse. 15 to 1 shot. That's right. He won't come within two seconds of the worst horse in the race. You know, Pops, you're my pet handicapper, even if you are on the racing board. But you can't make money on a favorite. And baby needs new shoes. You mean the allowance I gave you yesterday is all gone? You broke? You made a magnificent summary of the whole case. Lady Luck was no lady. Absolutely not. Not another nickel. All right, Pops. Well, this where are you going? Places? Steve, I'm Phyllis Bright and Max sent me. I want to get 200 down on Banjo Boy. Want that on the nose? That's the place that'll do the most good. Look, I don't have the 200 with me. I'm going to leave this for security. It's worth 500 in any hawk shop. Okay. Hey, Steve. That brooch is as phony as a mother-in-law's kiss. Yeah? How dare you? My father gave me that for a birthday present. I really ought to run her in. She's been trying to peddle that plate glass all day. It's a bad case. Thanks for tipping me, Mike. It's okay. Pardon me. I don't believe I've had the misfortune. No, I don't think we ever have met formally, Miss Bright. Your tactics don't call for much formality. Why did you tell that man this wasn't genuine? Well, if you'll pardon my humble opinion, I think you ought to show a deeper regard for sentiment. I understood you to say that that was a birthday present. Well, you don't think I'd part with it, do you? I'd have bought it back with the money I won. <laughs> what money you won? When? With your nerve, I'd hate to have a tooth pulled. Now, listen, your father's a good friend of mine. I know how he took it on the chin for years just to be able to give you pretty little baubles like that. Oh, well, I'm sure Pops will be very grateful. But if that horse wins... There they go! It's Banjo Boy and St. Louis. Now it's Banjo Boy coming away, and Banjo Boy the winner. <laughs> What's got into you? Oh, I had money on that banjo horse. You did, Annie? How much? Two dollars. I'm going to collect. <laughs> I can't understand that horse winning. Well, I can. And between you and your friends, a girl can't make an honest living. What do you mean? Well, I was about to put up my brooch for security when some smart aleck came along and cleared the deal. He said he was a friend of yours. Who was it? Well, I don't know, but he almost put my eye out with his keychain. Oh, Mike Shane, smart boy. Not so smart. He did me out of $3,000 I'd have won on Banjo Boy. You might have lost. Oh, that was a sure thing, Pops. Yeah? Who gave you that tip? Harry Grange. Harry Grange. Oh, sure thing, I. Eh? Uh, Dad, remember your high blood pressure. Freddy. Yes, sir. I hope you're all right on this. All I did is give him his head, Mr. Brighton. He was full of run today. Well, we'll know when the saliva test comes back. Yes, sir. Good work, Freddy. Thanks, Mr. Thomas. Hello, Elliot. Well, hello, Hiram. That horse certainly showed himself. I suppose you made a killing. I sure did. I cleaned up $30. You know, Banjo Boy's been improving steadily in his workout. But it was quite a surprise that he came through today. Yes, it was quite a surprise. Boys are making an awful mistake. I got a lot of important cases coming up. I'll pay you every cent. The East Side Furniture Company is terribly disappointed in you, Mr. Shane. Hey, look out. Don't scratch that. I'm going to have all that stuff back by next week. just leave the file. All my records are in there. I'm very sorry, sir, but such a request is out of my jurisdiction. It'll have to go through the regular channel. Hey! Well, how do you like that? Hello, Shane. Hello, Kincaid. Sit down. Make yourself at home. Moving? Yeah, the place was too small. You know how it is. 
I got a case for you. What kind of a case? Right down your alley. What do I get paid off in? Nice pictures of Washington and Lincoln with numbers on them. Big numbers. Now or when? A thousand now and the rest when? Hold it, boys. You heard the man. Now, suppose you just wait outside until we conclude this deal and then you can bring the stuff back in. Hmm? There are two installments due. Yeah, I know. Now, you'll get it. You'll get it. And if you don't mind, uh, close the door. Moving, eh? Like a guy came. Well, never mind about that. What's the angle? Well, a prominent citizen who can't afford to get his name in the papers has just become involved in a little mix-up. Who is he? You can't expect me to divulge the name of my client. But don't worry about the money. He's rolling in it. Go on. In order not to affect the track odds, my client gave a man $10,000 to spread around on a horse. The horse paid off, but the man didn't. Who's the guy? You know him, Harry Grange. Oh, Grange, yeah. <laughs> Sounds like Grange. Well, what am I supposed to do? Benny Gordon is a friend of yours. Grange is working for him. I want you to talk to Gordon and make him put the pressure on. It's a cinch. Is Gordon mixed up in this? No, no. Why should I put the pressure on Gordon? Because when you collect, there'll be 5,000 in it for you. While you might think lightly of my profession, it has got its ethics. Five thousand dollars will buy a lot of ethics. Not my kind. You weren't so particular when you handled that Kirby case, and plenty others. There's just a slight difference, Mr. Kincaid. Kirby had nothing to do with the mess he got into. Well, it wouldn't do you any good if I were to do a little talking. That's just a reminder to stay out of my business. Put that thing down before someone gets hurt. Hello. Hey, you. Hello. Oh, hello, Mr. Brighton. Mike, I've got to make a rush trip to New York. How'd you like to take a case for me? A case? What is it? Apparently, you know how to handle my daughter better than I do. Of course, I'm only her father. I want you to look out for her while I'm away. <laughs> Haven't you a pet wildcat you'd rather have me tame? Oh, just keep an eye on her. You can do it. Name your own fee. Fee? Did you say fee? That's right. Well, of course, things are moving awfully fast around the office, but for an old friend like you, I think I can find time. Fine. Bye-bye. All right, boys, move them back in. I got the case. You got the money? No, but it's all settled. Come on, come on. No, I'll help. I'll help. Here, let me... Hey, what? Look! Say, can't you take a guy's word for it? Good evening, Mike. Hiya, Steve. Say, uh, tell Charlie to run a rag over this, will you? Shall do. Thirty-four, red. Well, there goes little Phyllis. All my rabbits have flat feet. Oh, you came in all the time. And it's too bad you missed that killing at the track yesterday. Easy, Harry. That's my sore spot. Say, you're doing all right there. You've got a roll large enough to choke a horse. If you want to choke a horse. I'll buy you another stack. You have the beautiful face of a child. Maybe I ought to encourage it. Let me another 500. I wouldn't if I were you, Grange. Good evening, Miss Brighton. Oh, look, it's the red night. And I thought I was having bad luck. Say, that gives me a hunch. I'll go back and play red. Well, maybe we'll change our luck if we stayed out a while. I don't believe Mr. Shane uh, proves of gambling. No, I don't. Stop encouraging him. He'll be forward when he grows up. Hi, Mike. It's fine. Hey, is Benny upstairs? Yeah. Good. Now, you listen to me. I've gone through a lot of trouble to bring you up. I know what's best for you. I won't have you running around with that Harry Grange. Is that clear? What's wrong with him? Well, plenty. For one thing, he doesn't care anything about you. Or he wouldn't be chasing after that Brighton girl. You probably told him to keep away from me, that's why. I didn't. But it's not a bad idea. Am I interrupting anything? Hello, Marcia. 
How are you, Benny? Hello, Mike. I didn't hear you knock. No, as a matter of fact, I didn't. <laughs> Say, Benny, uh, how long has Harry Grange been shilling for you? That's a lie. Hmm? You and this two-bit dick framed this... Shut up. I won't shut up. You're running Harry down because you know how I feel about him. I said shut up! You don't care the snap of your fingers about me. Fuck all you care about is... Knock it out. Uh, doesn't that belong to you, Marcia? It's a funny thing about girls. Try to help them, that's the thanks you get. Yeah, well, that's the younger generation. Say, Benny, Harry Grange is at the roulette wheel with a friend of mine. He's feeding her C-notes on credit. She's much too young for that diet. So what am I supposed to do about it? Ask all my customers to bring their birth certificates with them? Now, you got plenty of business here without sending talent scouts to the kindergartens. This one of you turned missionary, Mike. I said she was a friend of mine. But she ought to know the ropes. Now, listen, Benny. I want you to give her back the money she's lost, and I don't want to get it the hard way. This isn't charity day. Look, I know everybody in this place. I know you got a bunch of mechanics working for you downstairs. I know you're operating a needle wheel. Sure, Mike. I know how to run a place. I'm in with the right people. Well, now, don't tell me you're kicking back to the Lone Ranger. Oh, stop clowning. Grange isn't telling her to bet. He may be lending her the money. Well, why should I give it back? Because I asked you to. Who's the girl? Phyllis Brighton. Send Grange and that Brighton girl up here. Thanks very much, Benny. I'm doing this for you, Mike, because we've always been such good friends. I'm running a nice place. I don't want any trouble. Oh, have a cigar. Thanks. That's a good cigar. Hasn't got that awful smell of tobacco, you know. Well, hello, Mr. Garden. Good evening, Miss Brighton. I'm sorry you've had such a bad streak of luck. We like our customers to enjoy themselves. Tell me, how much have you lost? Why, uh, practically nothing. How much was it, Grange? Oh, about 2,000. I'm returning your money to you, Miss Brighton. The fun is on us. That's ridiculous. After all, if I'd won, I'd have taken it. Oh, it's a very magnanimous gesture on the part of Mr. Gordon. You'd better take it. You may not feel in the mood again. No, thank you, Mr. Gordon. I prefer to get it back the hard way by winning it. Well, that's the way you feel about it. Wait a minute, Benny. I'll take it for her. So that's it. May I see you home, Miss Brighton? I wouldn't let you see me across the room. Oh, good night, folks. Let me go! Hey, what are you trying to get away with? That ought to be a lesson here, Miss Brighton. Never play the other fellow's game. Sorry, Benny. You ought to know better than a mix with Shane. Oh, he's getting too big for that hat of his. And you're not helping any by giving in to him, Benny. Don't worry about me. Anytime I get pushed to the handing out, I get it back. Double. No, miss, he's in the study. Quite a little nest you have here, Ponsby. Yes, sir, we think it rather cozy. Cozy, yeah? <laughs> I bet if you're walking your sleep, you need a bicycle. Pops! Is it true you've engaged this Mr. Shane to haunt me? You mean that he got you to come home at this hour? Don't you think you're carrying this a little too far? After all, I'm of age and no nincompoop. <laughs> That's a matter of viewpoint. All crazy people think they're sane. Crazy? On one subject, yes. Don't be a nincompoop. I won't have it. I won't be followed around by that, that... Yeah, that nincompoop. So far, he's done very well. That's what you think. Hello, I... Michael. Hello, Mr. Brighton. Mighty quick work. Don't let her out of your sight. Where do you live? 1472 Mulberry. Why? You're going to move right in here. Ponsby will get your things. Are you sure you got room? I think so. We'll put you in the West Wing, opposite Phyllis. Well, Hiram, haven't you left yet? Oh, yes, yes, I've left. Olivia, this is Detective Shane. Hello. Mr. Shane, this is Aunt Olivia. A detective? Mike, I'll see you when I get back. Yeah. 
Bye, Olivia. Bye. Bye, baby. Oh, Mr. Shane, I've always wanted to meet a real detective. Uh, I'm a sort of a detective myself. Oh, you're just an amateur, of course. But I've solved most of the Ellery Queen mysteries, and I did the battle book without missing a single battle. Oh, no, I did miss one. Now, let me see. If you don't mind, I'm going to bed. Not at all. Let's go. Oh, yes, it... Oh, oh, I remember now. It was the great piano mystery. The body was found under the piano. His throat was strangled with piano wires. The soft pedal was found embedded in his neck, and somebody had completely severed the head from the body. He was dead. Oh, suicide, hmm? No, it was murder. Really? Everything pointed to a very suspicious butler who had a passion for playing chopsticks. But, of course, I thought the murderer was a pet gorilla that belonged to the gardener. And who do you think killed him? I don't know. His sweet little innocent wife. Oh, yeah? How'd you find that out? I looked in the back of the book. <laughs> <laughs> this is your room, Mr. Shane. Oh. I'll have Ponsby bring you some things. Oh, thanks very much. Here's the key, if you wish to lock me in. Well, I wasn't going to, but since you insist. Good night. Good night, warden. No, that'll be all, Ponsby. Good night. Good night. Oh. oh, Mr. Shane, I forgot. I must tell you about another very interesting story. It's on the radio, and, and I wanted to get your opinion. It seems there was a man married to his wife, and she killed him. No one knew the motive. Well, maybe he didn't have enough privacy. Oh, no. You're not even warm. Well, when he was killed, they found a lock of his wife's hair in the back of his watch. At least everyone thought it was his wife's hair, but when they compared it, they found it was just ordinary cat's hair. You know, like they use on cats. Oh, go right ahead, young man. I used to be an art student. <laughs> now, um, when they found the man, his wife's scarf was right beside the body. It was a white scarf, like the one Phyllis had on when she left. And Phyllis then... left when? Well, just now, when I passed her in the hall. Just now. Oh, hello, Harry. Say, I want to apologize for that watchdog father unleashed on me. You mean to say your father hired that keyhole, Dick? I'm afraid so. Hello, Phyllis. Oh, hello, Mr. Thomas. You know Mr. Grange. Yes, good evening. Uh, good evening. Oh, I haven't seen you around for quite a while. Well, Will I... Will you pardon me, please? Uh, I'll be back in a few minutes. Well, certainly. Congratulations on Banjo Boy, Mr. Thomas. Thanks. Your father seemed a little skeptical about his ability to win. Oh, you know, Father. He's the old school. It always annoys him when a long shot comes in. Say, let's try the wheel, shall we? My palms are itching. Well, you go ahead. My weakness is Baccarat. Oh. <laughs> Harry. Oh, hello, Marsha. I want to speak to you. A little later. I have Don't to Don't give me that brush off. Marsha, I'm busy. Yes, I know. You've been busy with that Phyllis Brighton. Well, if you think you can get rid of me that easily, you're crazy. Oh, Marcia, don't talk like that. I'll talk, and you'll listen. You've been pushing me around long enough. I'm not taking it. Oh, don't fly off the handle for nothing. Be sensible about it. We're washed up, that's all. What do you have, Mr. Grange? Got your soda. Soda, Jimmy. How are you this evening, Mike? You've 
raised a question which will take quite some time to decide. Hey, Grange. Shane, I've had enough of you for tonight. Oh, I'm not here on business this time. I'm just slumming. You know, I'm really sorry that I had to cut in on you, but it was just part of my job. Yeah, I know. Now you're a nursemaid. No, I was. She framed me. When I took her home, she told her old man some lie about me trying to make a play for her, and he fired me. <laughs> She's no fool. No, sir. Say, uh, who is that guy at the corner table there? You see? Guy with the blonde? I don't know. I've never seen him before. I've seen his face someplace. You know, I found out one thing when I was on the carpet with old man Brighton. It might interest you. Well, I'll tell you outside. Dizzy. Well, maybe it's a fresh air. You're not used to it. Come on, sit in the car. Say, Pete, have my car sent around, will you? I'm going around. Sure, Mike. Hello, could I speak to Captain Painter, please? Hello? Hello, a police. Uh, listen. I'm camping on Craig's Road, or just half a mile past West Coast Club. I'm looking for firewood and find the body of a dead man in a car. Yeah. A juice off the road. Yeah. It's maybe murder. I thought there was some reason for my luck changing. You know why I'm here, Miss Brighton. All right, I'll go quietly. If you don't mind, Warden, I'd like to make a small deposit on my debt to Harry Grange. Grange? Well, he isn't here. I just saw him drive off in your car. In my car? Yeah. I can't understand why Harry took my car. I'm sure I don't know. Pardon me. Isn't that your car? Well, it certainly is my car. Harry, Harry! <sighs> He's been murdered! Well, and in your car. Well, what do we do? You wouldn't listen to me when I said you were running around with the wrong people. Now, if the police find out about this, you're going to be in an awful fix. Oh, you've got to help me. You, you've got to... I'm very sorry, my dear. There's nothing that I can do. If you'd have listened to me, if you'd have stayed in your room back there when I locked you in, see, this wouldn't have happened. Catsup. Of all the cheap, phony gags. So you thought you could scare me. Wake up, Harry. I'll take you home and sober you up. Mike. Mike, look! He is dead. He's been shot.
say. You're right. Well, that gag sure backfired. I only pulled the old cats up routine to scare some sense into you, but while I was gone, somebody put the real trimmings on. Look, there's a gun. Yeah. It's not a gun. It's my gun. Your gun? Come on, let's get out of here before the police come. The police? Well, what do you mean? To do it up brown, I called them. You did? Go on, get in the car. Look, you go home and you keep your mouth shut. Go on, step on it. I'll follow you right away. yet. Still cracking wise, huh? Whoever well, called up was right, Chief. The guy's dead. Been murdered. Who is it? It's Harry Grange. Grange, huh? You know him quite well, didn't you? Hmm. No better than you did. Shake him down, Al. All right, now, what is this, Painter? Am I under arrest? What do you think? Well, I think you're crazy, but don't let that influence you. He's clean, Chief. Is that your car? Yes. Take it out to headquarters. Oh, now, look, Painter, let's stop kidding ourselves. You know I got nothing to do with this case. Shut up. Keep everything in the way until the coroner gets here. All right, Shane. When are you going to start talking, Shane? Not until my attorney gets out of law school. Now, listen. You might just as well unload, because you're on a spot. I know as much about this case as you do, which is absolutely nothing. Listen, you've dummied up on me before, but this time I'm going to have you on my hands until you start talking. Then we ought to get to know each other pretty well. Those tactics aren't going to get you anywhere, Shane. Yeah. What? Who? Oh, hello, Gordon. I just heard a news flash. Harry Grange has been murdered. I think you ought to know that he and Mike Shane had an argument at my office tonight. Thanks. Thanks a lot. That's all I wanted to know. Oh, yeah. All right, boys, come and get it. And how? We've been waiting for it. Now make yourself comfortable, fellas. All right, Captain, let's have it. Well, here's your story. I'm holding Michael Shane on suspicion of murder. Why did you pick him up? About an hour ago, I received an anonymous call telling me of the murder. When I arrived on the scene, Shane was there. And the body was still warm. Well, yeah. And now Shane refuses to explain why he was there. What's the motive, Cap? We have plenty of motive. I just learned that Shane and the dead man had an argument tonight. How about it, Mike? You're in a spot. Give us the lowdown, Mike. Well, boys, looks like I'll have to do a little talking. Yeah, let's yeah, do it. Right. Right. You see, Painter wasn't the only one that got an anonymous telephone call to the scene of the crime because I got one, too. But I know who called me. Yeah? Who was it? Yeah. Well, at first, I didn't recognize the voice, but it's just now come to me because I've been listening to the same voice right here in this room. It was our captain of the homicide squad, Peter Painter. Me? Why, you... Oh, he'll deny it, of course. I expected that. But it's logical, isn't it? You boys know how Painter's been out to get me. And how. Oh, I get it there. Sure. I get it. You know I didn't make that call, Shane. You're just bluffing. Hoping that I'll back down. I don't care whether you back down or not. Without a shred of material evidence, you were ready to try me in the papers. Well, it works both ways. And how? Is that the way it's going to lie, Painter? Liar's right. Well, I don't want you boys to get off with only half-baked ideas. You certainly don't believe that I called Shane. 
Well, for that matter, if anyone called him. We're not printing opinions. We're stating facts. I'll take my oath that you did. And if you want anyone to believe that you're in the clear, pick up the man who did call. While Shane languishes in your Bastille, working up a swell case of false arrest. He's got you coming and going, Cap. Well, how about it? Does that suspicion of murder charge still stand? No, not officially. Now, uh, oh, look, fellas. If I release Shane, what occurred in this room tonight, off the record, right? What do you want us to do, Mike? Well, just play the whole thing down, boys. It might help us catch the murderer. Okay, Mike. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Use the phone outside. Well, Shane, you got me this time. But I've just started with you. Ah, ah, ah. Now, that kind of talk will only get you in more trouble, Painter. Well, if you don't mind, I'm going to clear out of this gas chamber. How about the keys to my car? We're holding that for further investigation. Well, I can tell you now the trouble's in the carburetor. Say, uh, what's the number of Mr. Kincaid's apartment? Uh, 205, but he's not in. You got any idea when he'll be back? No, he didn't say. Uh -huh. Okay, thanks. I tore my pants. Your head? What'd you do to it? It was open by mistake. Well, I'll get something for it. No, forget it. Forget it. Hey! Doesn't anybody ever knock in this you house? Sit down there and be quiet. I'm going to ask all the questions. Where have you been all night and what happened? Oh, practically nothing. After you left my car stall, the cops picked me up. <laughs> well, you didn't kill Harry Grange. Well, you've got more sense than the captain. He tried to pin it on me, but the pin wouldn't stick. No. It wasn't sharp enough. That burn? Oh, no. Well, then all. hold still. Where'd you get this cut? At some apartment house. They had a sale on them. Michael, for heaven's sake, say something sensible. All right, I will. Will you please get out of here and let me get dressed? Michael! What? Tell me, why would anyone want to kill Harry Grange? Harry Grange was mixed up with every racket in this town. Well, this is a fine time to tell me. Listen, I've given you everything but a lecture with lantern slides. I'm sorry, Michael. Well, it's too late now. Uh, 
Now listen, will you please leave so I can get dressed? There's work to be done. Well, I'm in this too, you know. Why? Michael, it really is my fault you got into this scrape. What is this? You going soft? Maybe. Yeah. All my life, I never worried about anybody but myself. And last night I realized what a jam I'd gotten you into. And well, I started worrying about you. Don't you think that sort of thing ought to be encouraged? Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right, you sit right here and keep on worrying. I have to go down and get my gun before one of Painter's bloodhounds picks it up. Well, I'm going with you. Oh, no, you're not. You're dead. Paying me plenty to keep you out of trouble. He told you not to let me out of your sight, didn't he? Okay, but I'll bet you'll be an awful nuisance. I'm not taking any more bets. On the level? Okay. Will you get out of here and let me get dressed? And hurry! You wait here. Oh, can I come along, Morton? You stay here and watch. Haven't you got any seats left in the balcony? Pardon me, stranger. I'm a detective investigating a murder that occurred here last night. I wonder if you could give me a little help. A, a mur murder here? Oh, I don't know anything about it. This is the first time I ever fished here. Look, I didn't even catch any fish yeah, yet. all right, hold it now. You see, I'm looking for clues, and I want a reputable witness in case I find any. Well, not me. I'm supposed to be working today, and if my wife finds out... You wouldn't want an innocent man to go to jail now, would you? You can't put me in jail. I didn't do anything. All I want you to do is verify any clues that I find. Now, come on, we'll look around. Oh, come I on. don't know anything about clues. I couldn't even find any fish around here. Uh, I don't like this. If my oh. wife... Hey, it's a gun. Is, is that a clue? It's a gun, all right. Now, what I want you to do is make a sworn statement as to what you've just witnessed here. Oh, but I couldn't do that if it got in the newspaper. It my won't wife, get I'm... in the papers. You're a resident of Los Angeles, aren't you? Fifteen years. Yeah. I like that. Am I a resident of Los Angeles? Do you know where Normandy Street is? Mm -hmm. When you go down two blocks, turn to your left, and... Oh, you've got to be awful careful because it's all kind of dug up there. And the Look, road... uh, this is the address of a lawyer friend of mine. He'll fix up an affidavit for you to sign. Just say where you found the gun and that it was fired. How do I know it was fired? Here, smell it. <clears throat> I got a cold. Yeah, my wife finds out about this. Let I... me assure you, my boy, your wife will not find out. Now, here, tell your wife to buy a new hat, huh? But you get right down to that lawyer's office, will you? All right, I'll That's go. Right. But if this gets in the papers, I'll hear from your attorney. Well, is everything all right? Everything is de lovely. Oh! What's the matter? Oh! A pin. Why, it isn't mine. I should say it isn't yours. It belongs to Marcia Gordon. Marcia Gordon? Yeah, I saw this fall off her dress in her dad's office last night. Well, what's it doing in my car? I don't know, but things are happening very fast around here. See, I am a help to you. Sure. Women make wonderful pets. Come on, let's go. Be back in a minute. Gordon residence. I'm sorry, but Miss Gordon is ill. Oh, I'm sorry. Thanks. Say, Chief, uh, is there a leather goods store around here? Yeah, Samson's. Two blocks down. Two blocks down. Thanks. Good morning. I'm Dr. Shane. I've come to see Miss Gordon. But Dr. Hayes is already... Dr. Hayes. Oh, yes, you see, Dr. Hayes asked me to drop in and see her. He's a little bit uh, anxious about some phases of Miss Gordon's illness. 
Well, I'll have to call up Mr. Gordon. Oh, pardon me. Does Dr. Hayes treat you too? Me? Yes, those eyes that... What's the matter with them? Uh, mm, uh, well, it's nothing serious. It's just a little disseminated sclerosis. But uh, tell me, have you been feeling uh, dizzy recently? Uh, 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 dizzy? Uh, me? Uh-huh. Well, uh, never mind. I'll examine you after I've seen Miss Gordon. Where is uh, Miss Gordon's room? Uh, right this way. Thank you. Are you sure it's not serious, Doctor? Oh, no, not very serious. Just keep off your feet and eat plenty of fish. Any particular kind? No, just fresh. Uh, be careful of the bones, of course. Uh, have you plenty of fish in the house? No, sir. Oh, will you go and order some right away? That's a good girl. Yes, sir. Anything? Only that this case gets goofier every minute. You know, while you were inside, I got an idea. I can't use it. I think Harry Grange was murdered for his money. What money? That shell never had any money. Well, he made a big killing on Banjo Boy that fatal day I met you. Well, that was a horse you were going to put yourself in hock on, huh? That's right. Harry told me he had $10,000 on the nose. And at 15 to 1, that's not mince pie. $10,000? That's got a very familiar ring. Meaning what? Kincaid wanted me to collect the money on a $10,000 bet from Harry Grange. Wait a minute. Father was suspicious of that race. He thought the horse was doped. Yeah, but they make a saliva test of every winner, don't they? Yeah. Could you get the chemist's report on Banjo Boy? I don't know. I could try. Why? Because if Banjo Boy was doped, I think I've got the answer. What? Do you know who owns Banjo Boy? Well, Elliot Thomas. That's right. Hey, taxi! Well, looks like I had a nice take. What do you want, Shane? Who were you protecting when you called Painter last night? Nobody. It was my civic duty to give Painter that information. Well, you sound like a very public-spirited man. How would you like to donate five grand to a very worthy charity? Five grand? What charity? To the Michael Shane home for Michael Shane. <laughs> well, it should be worth that to know where Marcia is. Well, she's home. Yeah. Here, warm that up. Oh, you're you're going to love this, isn't it? Hello, Jenny. Is Marcia in her room? Hello. What? She isn't? No, 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 don't do that. You just keep your mouth shut. Now, Mike, you're in trouble enough as it is. You can't get away with the snatch. You shouldn't lock a girl up to keep her quiet. Oh, you can't believe a word she said. She's out of her head, hysterical. And had some very interesting information. Am I to understand that you want five grand to return Marcia? Mm -mm. For five grand, you retain me to find her and return her. I'm not interested. You're not. Hello.
No, not now. I'm tied up. Or not before 8 o'clock. All right. What's the address? Yeah, hold the phone. Hello. I'll be there. All right. Well, I'm sorry we couldn't make a deal. A uh, wait, Jane. I'll tell you what I'll do with you. I'll split 50-50, 2,500 COD. Mm -mm. Five grand not COD. An escrow in my bank before it closes today. Here, I'll... Uh... I'll write it out, just the way I want it. Oh, never mind. I know how you want it. Okay. Wait a minute. How do I know that you know anything about her? That you're not trying to bluff me? Oh, I... I thought you were going to ask me something like that. Do you recall the, uh, the tan and brown striped coat and the little tan turban that Marsha owned? Yes, I think I do. Call up Mother Hubbard. See if it's still in the cupboard. All right, the money will be there. Oh, thanks, Benny. And when I build the Michael Shane home, you can lay the cornerstone. glad you've come. Did you know that a friend of Phyllis's had been murdered? No, you're kidding. No, really. Here it is in the paper. I'm making a file on it. Here I've been solving other people's murders all my life. And now to have one so close to home, why, it's just wonderful. Ponsby and I have started working on the case, but we haven't any decent clues, have we, Ponsby? Only the fact that Mr. Grange died in a sea of tomato catsup. Yes, and that doesn't make sense. The baffle book always gives you one or two things you can get your teeth into. Well, Andy, here's one that'll give you lockjaw. The tax collector just told me that Elliot Thomas has a beach house on Beach Street at Balboa Beach. That's wonderful. I look in my files. And... <coughs> if I may suggest, madam, we might find something under the heading of Sea Breeze. Elliot Thomas? What's he got to do with it? Oh, I don't know. But it seems funny, doesn't it? A man who owns a beach house on Beach Street at Balboa Beach? Yes, that is peculiar. But Mr. Grange wasn't drowned. He was shot. And in that case, there should be a murder weapon. Yes. Yes, you're quite right, Auntie. Now, just speaking theoretically, if it was a choice between these two guns, which one would you pick? This one. Because it's been fired and it's jammed. That's very good, Auntie, because that is the gun that killed Harry Grange. Oh. And it also belongs to me. You? Mm-hmm. Did you kill Harry Grange? No. No, I found my gun lying beside the body. A shyster lawyer took it from my office. Oh, that's too bad. Then the case is solved. Oh, no, not exactly. I can't find the lawyer. Well, that's wonderful. Then maybe we can pin it on to somebody else. Hmm? Whose gun is this? Oh, I found that in Marcia Gordon's room. She was in love with Grange. Here's some interesting data on the formation of spray and spume. Look, they're identical. Both 38s and the same make. Yeah. Ponsby, what was the name of that case with the two identical guns? The case of the broken bed spring, madam. Yes. Don't you remember? The criminal switched the barrel of his gun to the police commissioner's gun. Well, why don't you go out and steal the commissioner's gun? You think I could? Say, Addie. Say, wait a minute. You know, Andy, I think you've got something there. See, Painter thinks that I did this. Now, if he starts nosing around the casino long enough, he's going to pick up some information that won't do me any good. I'm going to switch the barrel of my gun with Marsha Gordon's. Why? Here, give me a... That's it. Because I've got a hunch that Gordon knows plenty. This will put Painter on his trail. Yeah. So that's the way they do it. I couldn't make any sense out of what it said in the book. 
Watch this carefully, Ponsby. We might want to use it sometime. I will, madam. The time the inspector gets all this unraveled, he'll be so mixed up. <laughs> they can use him for a recipe for upside-down cake. Hey, see, Andy? They fit perfectly. Mm -hmm. Now, I'll tell you what I want you to do. Chief, I got it. I got the ketchup they found on Granger's shirt. That's great, Al. Now watch out. Look out for the fingerprints on the bottle. Huh? Well, give me Casey in the fingerprint room. But, Chief, look, I, I, I want... Quiet. Hello, Casey. Now, this is important. I want you to get me the fingerprint classification on the catsup bottle. I'm going to bust this Grange case wide open. But look, Chief, I, I just bought that bottle at a grocery store. It's the same kind of catsup, but not the same bottle. I, I tried... Homicide Squad, Captain Painter speaking. What? Oh, yeah. Well, that's very interesting. Okay, we'll be right over. Come on, Al. We're finally catching up with Shane. We're from headquarters. I'm over the conscription age. Police headquarters. Oh. The cops, madam. Oh, I'm so glad you've come. I've been so nervous. You see, my brother hired Michael Shane, but I think he's made a horrible mistake. He's been acting very suspiciously, and I just saw him hide two guns in the study. Mm. Say, Chief. Let's have a look. Right in that drawer. Well, there's two, two guns, Chief. This one's been fired. Copy those serial numbers. Now, do you happen to remember... Well, hello, Captain. What's given out? Oh, nothing. Nothing much. No, oh, don't tell me the arm of the law is paralyzed. Since when have you been carrying two guns, Shane? Oh, so that's it. You've got an accomplice now, huh? Don't you think you're getting a little over your head in the social swim? What about these guns? The one with the chip on the handle is mine, and the other is a little trophy I picked up on the hunt today. Call Joe and check on those numbers. Very careless of you, Shane, not to have cleaned and reloaded this gun. It's been fired recently. Yes, I know. I noticed that. Al calling. I want you to check a couple of gun numbers for me. I picked that gun up this morning about a hundred feet from where they found Granger's body. The murderer must have thrown it there. Naturally, you would cover up with some such story. Oh, no. I have an affidavit from a substantial citizen who witnessed it. That only proves you threw it away yourself last night, after you killed Grange. Why, do you mean that Mr. Shane is implicated in the Grange murder? Oh, that's terrible. Now, I just finished telling you that the other gun is my gun. It's registered in my name. I have a permit to carry it. That's right, Captain. This gun belongs to Shane. Well, who owns this one? Oh. Captain, is that the gun that killed Harry Grange? I'll know more about that after we make the ballistic test. I'll be very anxious to hear. Here's your gun, Shane. Aye, thank you. Come on, Al. Just keep dropping in, Captain. We may be able to place you. And if anything turns up, we'll be very happy to notify you. You've been a big help, lady. Aren't you going to take him along? If anything happens, just phone me. Why, Andy, you were swell. Do you know that you're a grand little actress? Oh, don't be foolish. But when I was young, 
I mean, a little younger. In New York, I played Madame Butterfly. You did? Mm-hmm. What race? You know, I'd feel much better if Painter would let us in on what's going on. Hello, everybody. Hey, where have you been all afternoon? Well, they wouldn't give me a chemist report on Banjo Boy, so I hid in the washroom and stole it after everybody Good was gone. Good girl. You're going to be terribly disappointed. Banjo Boy wasn't doped. What? Well, that gums up that lead very nicely. Sounds like painter's ring. Oh, well, maybe they found out I took the report. Is Michael Shane still here? Yes, he's in the study. Shall I tell him that you... Well, well, well. Good evening, Mr. Shane. Miss Murray, did you forget something? Yeah. Where's your gun? Why? Never mind why. Where's your gun? Did you make the ballistic test, Inspector? Yes, we made it. So you think you're clever? I found out how you prowl Gordon's house. And it's not hard to guess how you got hold of his gun. Hey, wait a minute. You mean to say that the gun you tested didn't kill Grange? Absolutely not. Looks like our trick didn't work. Trick? What trick? Oh, it's a trick. I was just teaching her some card tricks. Right? Yeah? Well, this time I'm taking your nice clean pistol to headquarters. And you with it. All right. All right, I'll go. Still think you're making a mistake, both of you. We've been all over this before. Oh, 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 oh. Get him! What'd you say, Chief? I said get him! Oh! Ow! Here! There's no time for explanations. We've got to work fast. Why was the inspector so upset? Because my gun didn't kill Grange. Then it must have been Marsh's. Right. And now Painter's going to make a test of my gun with Marsh's barrel on it. Oh, that's terrible. Then they'll think you're the murderer. I've got to pull that killer out of the hat before Painter picks me up. No jury will ever believe I switched those barrels. That's right. Say, Andy, I want you to copy this ten times as closely as possible. Ten times. Why, well, that's forgery. You're telling me? You'll be able to write your own baffle book before you get through with this case, Andy. Run along. Now, Phyllis, upstairs in my room, there's a hat and a coat and a bag belonging to Marsha Gordon. I want you to call Elliot Thomas. Make an appointment to meet him at 7.30 in front of the library. And you wear those clothes. You've got Andy committing forgery. What do you want from me, kidnapping? Now, never mind about that. Just stall him along. Tell him anything. Tell him about Banjo Boy. But be sure he gets a good look at you in those clothes. That's the important thing. And then ditch him. Now, you got that? Yeah. All right. I'll borrow your car and I'll pick you up as soon as he drives away. So there's a mud pack to me. Hello, Phyllis. Good evening, Mr. Thomas. Well, now what's so urgent? Well, uh, you know how suspicious father was a banjo boy. I saw this on his desk, and I thought maybe you'd like to see it. Well, that's awfully nice of you, but I had no fears about Banjo Boy. Is that all you wanted to see me about? Well, yes. Oh, well, thanks for your interest. Can I drop you somewhere? Well, no, thanks. I'm waiting for Aunt Olivia. Oh, well, maybe I'll see you at the track tomorrow. Yes. Good night. Good night. Did you make out? Well, 
I had any idea what I was doing, I might be able to tell you. Nice work, fellas. Give me those clothes. You got the notes, Annie? Yeah, here they are. Did the best could. Oh, that's fun. Say, these have a professional touch. You haven't been working with a paper hanging outfit, have you? No, Ponsby taught me the science of forgery. He's very clever at it. He is. Where are you going now? Down to Elliot Thomas's house at Balboa Beach. There's going to be a meeting of the Little Mothers Club. We'll drive you down. Oh, no. This is going to be a stag party. Wait a minute. Aren't we in on this, too? Uh-uh. I'll call you in the morning and let you know what happens. And if you don't hear from me, I'll be in the county jail. How do you like that? Gives us a build-up for a Rolls Royce and then hands us a kitty car. Well, nobody's gonna hand me a kitty car. It's the first case I've ever had where I couldn't look in the back of the book. We are going to Balboa. Glad you've come. I thought it was pretty easy for you with all your money to take Harry Grange away from me. To set up for you. You're crazy. Put that gun down. Well, one more murder won't make any difference. Can't do any more than hang you. Did, did you kill Harry Grange? Wouldn't be. Gosh, Annie, that was close. How'd you ever do it? Oh, I've seen him do it so often, murder mistress. That was easy. We better lock her in the closet. Annie, you don't think she's already gotten to Michael? That girl's a maniac. Let's look upstairs. Keep out of sight. Up here must be on the other side of the house. That's where the bay is. Yes, it looks better out there. There's Inspector. What's he doing here? I don't know. Well, Gordon. Do you have any trouble finding the place? Not at all. Let's go inside. Hey, there are some clothes. And the coat. Yeah, and here's a note. Hmm. Looks like a suicide note. Yeah, but the guy who telephoned me said she was thrown off the pier. And this note is signed Marsha. Who's Marsha? Gee, I used to know a dame called Marsha once. Yeah? But when she sued me, I found out her real name was Mabel. Look, the life just went on. There's somebody in the house. Come on. 
Lovely place you have here. Yeah? I'm glad you like it. The smoke? Thank you. How did you make out the casino last night? I broke a little better than even. Got your keys now? Yeah. Hurry up. Never mind the formalities, boys. Come on in. What are you doing down here? Shh. I got an anonymous telephone call. I got one, too. Say, what are you trying to do? Take me for a sleigh ride? Shh, please. We're right back where we... Shh. What do you know about these? Shh. Follow me. Hey, Chief, look out for the pan! We... I thought you said we were going to be alone. What are you trying to pull? What are you doing here? Well, I was just... Never mind that. What do you know about these clothes? Will you please explain what this is all about? The captain's a little gruff, but he's really got a heart of gold. He merely wants you to help him identify these clothes. What's that got to... Why, those are Phyllis Brighton's. What's happened to her? Phyllis Brighton's? Would somebody please tell me what this is all about? At 7.30, I was informed that someone carried a body out of this house and threw it in the bay. Are you insinuating that I had anything to do with it? I'm not insinuating. I'm telling you. And the whole thing's ridiculous. Gordon was here when I drove up five minutes ago. What are you trying to do? Put me in the spot? Well, Thomas could have been here earlier. Maybe he just took a driver on the block. I understand what Mr. Shane is driving at, but I'm sorry to disappoint him. I don't know how these clothes got out here, but I do know that Phyllis Brighton was wearing them when I was with her at 7.30 tonight. That's the time you received your information, wasn't it? Well, yeah. Can you prove that? Certainly. If you call Miss Brighton, I'm sure she'll verify it. There's a phone right over there. Shane! Say, what's going on here? Phyllis, are you hurt? Inside, inside. Oh. What is this, a convention? What are you doing here? Well, I, we, we were, were just... only doing our civic duty, Inspector. We knew you wanted Mr. Shane. So when I saw him sneak out the back door of our home, I, we tailed him. Now, we're getting somewhere. What time did he get here? Well, about ten minutes ago. Oh. Then he couldn't have done it. Well, if she's telling the truth, how could Thomas have been with Miss Brighton at 7.30? That's right. But, Miss Brighton, when I was with you, you were wearing these clothes. Uh, I don't know what you're talking about. Those aren't my clothes. Well, if they're not Miss Brighton's clothes, then whose are they? Perhaps Mr. Gordon can enlighten us. Don't they belong to your daughter, Marcia? Marcia? Now we're beginning to get to the bottom of this. Hey, how did you know that? Because those were the clothes she was wearing when she disappeared. Don't you remember? I described them to you there in the office. Disappeared? How do you know she disappeared? Because Mr. Gordon hired me to find her. He probably didn't want the police department to mess it up, you know. <laughs> Is this your daughter's handwriting? Well, that reads like a suicide note. She's in the asset clay. Quiet. This might be Marcia's handwriting. But she'd never kill herself. Well, if it was a suicide, then it must be murder. That verifies the report I got. If that's Marsha's handwriting, it certainly is suicide. She was in love with Grange. Maybe she thought life wasn't worth living after he was gone. You seem awfully anxious to make it look like suicide, Thomas. What about it, Gordon? Is it her handwriting or isn't it? I don't know. It might be some sort of a plant. With you mixed up in it, it might be anything. Oh, now, Benny, don't try to tell me you can't... Listen, Shane. If there are any more questions to be asked, I'll ask them. All right. I'm just trying to help matters. Oh. What was that? Oh. What's the matter, Annie? I think I've got growing pains. All right, all right. Now, let's settle down. 
I'll get to the bottom of this if it takes all night. Let me see. Uh, where were we? Oh, yes. Why didn't you call the police, Gordon, when your daughter disappeared? Because I didn't think it was any of their business. And I suppose you don't think it's any of their business if your daughter was murdered. Hey, Chief. What? Something's burning. What? The wastebasket. Come on, put it out. Turn that over. Can't you even turn the wastebasket over? That's it. Hold it, man. Nice work, Shane. First suicide, then murder, now arson. Well, I'm sorry, Chief. I didn't know all those papers were in there. You're sorry. Well, it could happen to anybody. Didn't you ever set anything on fire? Nothing like that ever happened to me. Hey, Chief. No. There's a suicide note. Well, how did that get in there? I don't know. Well, I thought I put that in my pocket. Say, there's two of them. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and here's eight more. What? Let me see those. You might have got away with it, Thomas, if you'd been more careful. Those practice notes prove that you forged that note to make it look like suicide. That's a lie. The whole thing's a frame-up. I tell you, I didn't kill Marsha. I didn't. Why, you dirty double-crosser. That won't do any good. He'll hang for Marsha anyway. We've got everything now but the motive, and you can supply that. You bet I can. Marsha saw him kill Grange. She came back to my office, scared to death. I sent her home and told her to... To keep quiet about it, huh? You thought you had a chance to hang it on me. And also that you had something to blackmail Thomas with for the rest of his life. Where did you ditch Larry Kincaid's body, Thomas? I didn't kill him. It was an accident. I met Kincaid down here one night on business. He threatened to blackmail me. We got into an argument. I lost my temper and went after him. Kincaid pulled a gun on me. In the struggle, it went off and killed him. I threw his body into the bay. How'd you kill Grange? I was frantic. I didn't know what to do. I realized Grange was the only one who knew Kincaid was in my house. The gun had jammed, so I took it along with my gun to the casino. When I saw you and Grange leave, I followed. I shot Grange with my gun and left what I thought was Kincaid's to make it look as if he did it. What were you doing in Kincaid's apartment last night? I went there to destroy the only bit of evidence which would connect me with Grange. So? It was you that I've got to thank for that clunk in the head I got, huh? So that's why our trick didn't work. Neither one of the guns we had the inspector pick up killed Grange. I've been framed! You know, there's one thing I can't understand, Thomas. Why would a man in your position become involved with people like Kincaid and Grange? I got in a jam. I needed money fast. I'd bought a South American horse that had never run in the States. It had the same markings as Banjo Boy. To keep myself in the clear, I had Grange substitute the horse for Banjo Boy in that race. Oh, so that horse was a ringer, huh? Well, no wonder the chemist report was negative. Of course. Well, Painter, here's your story. Thomas gave Grange $10,000 to bet. The ringer won, but Grange wouldn't pay off. So Thomas hired Kincaid to collect. Kincaid came to me, but I wouldn't have any part of it. So he contacted Grange himself. Grange told Kincaid the whole story, and Kincaid used it to blackmail Thomas. Now, there's your case. Sorry that I haven't got the silver platter with me. Well, it may be a case to you, but it's still a lot of goulash to me. Whose clothes are those? Who got thrown off the pier? Well, I'm sorry, but that happens to be just a little figment of my imagination. You mean, you're the man who telephoned me? Oh, shucks, you guessed it. All right, Shane. Where's Marsha? Well, I'm sorry. That's one of the things that I... Uh, that's what I've been trying to tell you. She's in the closet. What? In the closet? How'd you know she was in there? Marsha. Are you all right? I'm all right. What are you doing here? I came here to even things up with Elliot Thomas. But Mr. Shane has saved me the trouble. I'm taking you home. Wait a minute, Gordon. I don't think you'll want to take her where you're going. Say, that's right. Suppressing the evidence in a murder case is compounding a felony. Say, you're under arrest. And Gordon, I'll be down at the bank bright and early to collect that five grand for delivering Marsha. But you didn't deliver her. Well, I... Well, Eddie and I are in partnership. Aren't we, Andy? We'll split it. Come on, Gordon. Let's go, Thomas. Oh, Painter. Hmm? Please, don't mention my name in the papers. I will. Okay. I'll mention you, too. Thanks so much. Well, 
That closes that case. Oh, no, it doesn't. You can't unload me that easily. I'm still your case until Father gets back. I may get him to put you on a permanent retainer. You know, I don't think this case was half as hard as that one in the baffle book about the great piano mystery. You know, where the body was found under the piano? His throat was strangled with piano wires and the salt pedal was found in bed. It seems that you like watching these old mystery films from the 1930s and 40s as much as we all do. If you'd like to show your appreciation in a tangible way, then why not share a little love by giving us a one-time small donation? We'd appreciate that, as it will encourage us to continue on with this work of bringing these forgotten gems to you on a regular basis. Simply click on the donate link below, in this video's description, and while you're right there you can click on our mystery merch shop as well or visit us on Facebook, or find our free bonus movie link. Thank you so much. and make room. Right now it's the most comfortable place in the world for you. You're not going to turn me over to anybody for a crime I didn't commit? Keep your head and your voice low. And tell me what did happen. That's funny, because I never had a brother. No, and what's more, I never had a sister either. You never had a sister? Well, what do you think of that? No, no sister, no brother. In fact, I'm an orphan. Ain't that sad? Somebody made a mess of this apartment. Certainly made a mess of Mr. Moxley. Huh? Hit him on the head of the poker, stabbed him in the back. Gosh, that's enough to kill any man. I got an uncle in Australia who's rolling in dough. And you got a cousin in San Quentin that's waiting to get his neck stretched. Yes, but Perry Mason doesn't deny that it was a false identification, even if you do. Remember, you're fooling around with a murder charge, All here. right. I, I haven't got a chance. Yes, you have. True, they've got you. They've got Dr. Milbeck and Flora Bell. They've got almost everything. <laughs> almost. Tell me, Perry, is there some hope? What are you going to do? <laughs> Remember, it's a Clue Club mystery masterpiece.